Thank you very much for joining us, uh, oh, Mr. For Lyle. Me. I suppose we ought to start at the beginning um, with football, you, your journey into football. Do you have an earliest memory of watching football, playing football, getting involved with football? I played football, I weren't very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, ma mainly just like going to games, first couple of games, Arsenal games I went to and my cousins, um, they're sort of ones that really got me into it. And as soon as I went to Highbury to watch Arsenal, I was just spitting. You know, bitten by the bug. It was all the fans there, the atmosphere. We had a very good team those days as well. And yeah, and just from there, I just, I mean, I already loved football. I was really, you know, an Arsenal fan, but going there and actually experiencing it with other fans, that was it. I was done, I was, I was in for life. Fast forward then to 2012, 2013, you're working with the BBC. <coughs> Where does the idea come from? No, sorry, at that time I was working as a surveyor. I was okay, so you left the BBC, you're working as a surveyor. Yeah. Where does the idea come from to set up your own sort of fan TV show? So what it was for me is like, like, I always used to hear all the pundits talking about Arsenal in particular, and sometimes some of the opinions that I hear and some of the things they said about the team, I was sort of like, well, that's not what, when I was speaking to other fans, that's not what we were talking about. We were talking about different things. We had different points of views on players. And I just really wanted to have a platform where different fans, no matter who you were, could have their say on Arsenal. So I had the idea, but I had a friend of mine who's got a boxing channel at the time called um, Coogan Cassius. Got a t he's got a channel called IFL TV, very successful. And me and him sort of go way back. We used to go to um, Highbury together. And because he had experience in it, I went to him and I said, listen, let's, you know, would you be willing to come in with me and we could start doing this channel? And I explained to him, you know, be interviewing fans and stuff like that. But he couldn't do it because he was just so busy with his channel. So after that now, I was sort of thinking, well, how do I do this? Because I, I, I've not got no experience in social media, in filming. As I said, I was working at that time as a building surveyor. Um, but I just, I was determined to do it, even though I didn't have a clue how I was gonna do it. And I just basically got together with a friend of mine who builds websites, asked him to build me a website. And as it turned out, he said to me, he goes, oh, well, Robbie, I, I work at a film studio that, you know, it was a tiny little studio, but they used to do like adverts and that. And he said, I know how to film, I know how to edit. So he goes, and I think your idea is a pretty good one. I'll come with you. I'll come in with you. So I was like, oh, brilliant. So we borrowed a microphone. We borrowed a camera, which in those days, the camera we used to have and we had for about the first year and a half wasn't a digital camera. Even though it was a big, impressive looking camera, it was one of those ones where it was up on a tape. So every time we filmed something, if we filmed two hours of footage, we had to wait for two hours before we could process it and get it all off. But we borrowed that and we just turned up at the Emirates and just started interviewing fans and speaking to fans and getting their opinions. And at first, you know, the first couple of times you're doing it, you're a bit apprehensive because you're thinking, what if he is football? You know what football fans are like? What are people going to think? You know, there was a couple of people that were like, who the hell are you lot? You know, <laughs> go away sort of thing. But then after that, you know, I just looked on it and I've always said, said to people, I just looked on it based on the law of averages. There's 60,000 people at the Emirates, must be able to get at least 10, right? <laughs> and we did. And what I noticed straight away is that the, the videos that we did, the, and I remember the first game we did, we beat Tottenham 5-2 for that Tottenham fan that was, where is it gone? <laughs> yeah, the good old days. <laughs> well, we beat, we beat uh, Tottenham 5-2. And um, what I noticed straight away is that people who were uh, filmed in those videos, they shared them. They shared them around social media. So there was videos like getting 50 views, 100 views. I mean, we, we were high-fiving each other. We were like, 100 views, you know? And, um, but people were sharing them. And I was like, you know what? I think, I think we're onto something here, right? My plan originally was, because I was self-financing it myself, um, out of my job. So my, my plan at the originally was, let's just do home games. But after doing the first home game, I'm like, you know what, let's, let's, next week, let's go away and see what that's like. So we went away and we did Aston Villa away. And 
I found that the response from that was just as good as the Tottenham game. And I was like, well, and when I was reading all the comments on that, people were saying, oh, what an insight. I didn't even, there were people who didn't even realise that people travel for hours to get to a football game, you know? And I just realised then, I was like, you know what? The majority of people who follow Arsenal don't go away. You know, there's only three and a half thousand fans that <clears throat> probably get to go away with the team. So I'm like, yeah, we're going to start doing the away games as well so we can give a real insight and also let fans have their opinions as well. And just from there, we just continue doing every single game because I just made the decision then that we're going to do every game. And yeah, from just there, it's just been a journey since then, since that day. Did you expect it to be a success or was it sort of a hobby that then you realised you were tapping into something? Right from the day one, you know, I, I thought it could be successful. I didn't realise it would be as big as it is, but I thought it could be, um, I thought it could be a success. And even though, obviously, it, it was a business, and even though, you know, it, it's my passion. Arsenal's my passion. So I, I, I worked ridiculous hours doing it, but I loved every minute, and I still do love every minute of it because... It's my passion, it's the club I love, the people you meet, the fans of all the different clubs. It's, it's just an amazing thing. How do you think AFTV and your style of reporting that you've been doing for the last 10 years or so has shaped the nature of football reporting in mainstream media and across the world? I think it's changed it a lot. Um, we were sort of the first people to do it in that way where we speak to fans after games and get their opinions and you know, and, and really, really allow them to have their say. And I think that what we allow people to do is not only have their say, but to have their say on a very big platform. So, you know, their opinions could be really heard. And, you know, I see loads of people copying what we do. It is very funny yesterday, it's a bit, well, not funny, but a bit ironic. Yesterday, I was doing some filming um, in Manchester yesterday with Gary Neville and Jamie Carragher. And I remember I had a little spat with Gary Neville like probably about five years ago when he had a bit of a go at AFTV. He's like, oh, what a rabble. You know, they, they're allowing people to come on and fans and have their opinions. And, they, they, you know, like he, he had a real go at us, right? And then it ended up that um, I had a go back at him <laughs> and it really went mad, right? And then um, Sky got us together and we did this amazing video where... He spoke to us about his opinions and what, and we, we told him about, listen, why a fan, why fan, you know, yeah, you're a great pundit, we think you're brilliant, but why shouldn't a fan who goes to watch every single game is invested in his club? It really hurts us if we lose, we're overjoyed if we win, why shouldn't we be able to have our say? And we kind of walked away from that and very, in a very amicable way, and he kind of had a lot of respect for us. And what was ironic for me now yesterday, I'm doing some filming for him, I'm up on stage like this, speaking to him, Jamie Carragher, and all the audience is fans. And I'm like, well, that's it. <laughs> Just goes to show you. I mean, so I think that, you know, a lot of, people, a lot of things that we've done has been copied, but it's a, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And the more fans are involved and engaged in football, the better. We saw that Super League thing, you know, what happens when you don't involve fans. So I should have a question <clears throat> directly on that, which is, how, how important do you think that the role of fans in media channels like yours was in stopping the Super League from forming? I think it was, you know, <laughs> certainly we were all over it. Lots of other media channels and the fact that, you know, every fan's got their own social media account and that. And they made it very clear immediately that we were unhappy with this Super League thing, you know what I mean? And sort of how dare you go and r try and rip away our game for, you know, just to make extra money. And these guys are already making huge sums. And now to make, to guarantee you making money, you're ripping the game away from the very people that without it. We saw during the pandemic when there was no fans inside the game, how dead football was really. Um, you're trying to rip the game away from those people. So I thought it was very influential. Very influential. You saw politicians having to get involved. I'm not sure how much Boris is a football fan. Right. But even he couldn't ignore it because, you know, the football fans were, you know, quite rightly outraged by what was going on. Um, 
And I think it kind of showed one of the big problems in football, you know, in that fans are not properly respected. And if you don't have fans at a game of football, as I said, you saw during the pandemic, the game still can play football, we still show it on TV, but it ain't the same. Yeah. Um, so you said that one of the first games you reported on for FTV was when <clears throat> uh, Arsenal beat Spurs 5-2. Say, what, which one was it again? Pardon? Say it again. Arsenal beat Spurs. Where is he again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <He's over> there. <laughs> obviously that doesn't seem to happen much anymore. Ooh. Um, <laughs> yeah. hey, that's evil, man. It just comes back to you. <laughs> um, what well, is... then, but, no, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, no, no, no. Because you know what a lot of, a lot of people forget? When they play, we play two games a season, <laughs> yeah? When they play this at the Emirates, we beat them 3-1. When we played them at their place, they beat us 3-0, on as even. Who's in the Champions League? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, well, what is your response to Arsenal not making the Champions League? It is very disappointing, very disappointing. Um, if you said to me at the start of the season, Arsenal going to get fifth place, I would have said, you know, that's a great achievement because my prediction at the start of the season was probably sixth. When I looked at Man United, how they strengthened, when I look what Chelsea had done, even Tottenham, I looked at all the teams, I was like, and I looked at our team, I'm like, we're going to have a hard time even getting a top six. Leicester, I was looking at all these teams. But why it's disappointing is that it was in our hands for so long to get that top, top four position. I was chatting to a gentleman earlier who's a Palace fan and I was saying to him, I think we kind of lost it there. When we came back after the international break and we didn't beat Palace, we kind of, they took us apart at their place. Then we lost to Brighton, then we lost to Southampton. I think those three games really, you know, and then we left ourselves a lot to do. And to, to go away to Tottenham where we don't have a great record, to be fair, and then to go away to a sort of revived Newcastle was always going to be really tough. But it's disappointing how it ended up. But we go again, you know what I mean? And for all the Tottenham fans, we'll see you in January when you drop out of the Champions League. You know I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sounding very bitter around that. <laughs> so what do you think Arsenal does need to do next year to have a better season, to make it into that top four? We need to strengthen our squad. In, in, in um, the summer, Arsenal needs to strengthen the team. Um, I think we've got some unbelievable young players. Um, you know, you can see him from the England squad, Saka, Smith Rowe, these guys have been selected, Ben White, um, Ra Aaron Ramsdale. We've made, some, we made some good signings last year as well. And we've got some unbelievable team. The basis is there for a very, very good team, but we need to add more quality. I think that's what let us down right towards the end. We had a lot of injuries to key players. And I just look at the squad, there's a lot of players leaving because their contracts are running out. So we need to strengthen, but we need to strengthen with real quality because it's getting harder and harder, the Premier League. I mean, you just see Man City, what they've done this season, and now they've gone and bought Haaland as well. So it's going to be harder. Obviously this year, Arsenal's focused mainly on, on British football. Do you think it's been a bit of a missed opportunity not playing European football this last year? Yeah, because we, we basically only had one game per week. Next year now, we're back in Europe. I look at another reason for strengthening is that we're going to be back in Europe. So that's number one. Um, you know, Thursday, Sunday, every week, literally. That's going to be tough. It's a World Cup year. And we all know the World Cup this year, you know, is in November. So the season's going to stop. You're going to need a good squad because how are players going to be when they come back after the World Cup in December? We see even in the summer sometimes when players come back how shocked they are. You know, after they've had the summer, they've had a little holiday and they come back, it takes them a few weeks to get going. There's going to be five substitutions in games next season. Again, you need five quality players on the bench. You know, if you look to Arsenal in the running, we had like loads of youngsters on the bench. Charlie Patino, Swanson, Amari Hutchinson, great talents. But actually, if you actually look on it, none of them ever came on which makes me see, it just shows me that they were just there kind of filling out the bench. So we've really got to strengthen, really got to strengthen. Another sort of recent question. Did you predict the, the, outcome, the other outcome of the weekend with City beating Liverpool in the league? I did. I did. I thought, I, I thought that, I, I just didn't think it'd be so dramatic. I thought City would beat Villa easily and I thought Liverpool would win their game easily and, it, and how that turned out, it was amazing and... I was at the Emirates 
um, watching the Arsenal game, of course, so we were playing Everton. And I was trying to get the scores of, because I, listen, I wasn't trying to get the Tottenham score. I knew they'd beat Norwich. <laughs> Norwich are hopeless. <laughs> right? And I'm, ah, oh, Norwich, don't, right? But, <laughs> but um, I was trying to see what the scores were in those Liverpool. And somebody said to me, go, Robbie, City are losing 2 0. I go, what? City. I looked across at the Everton fans at the other end, they're all down. I was thinking, they're not actually down because they're losing 4-0 at Arsenal. <laughs> they're down because they're going to have to do that drive back to Liverpool. And when they get there, there's going to be all Liverpool fans out in the streets celebrating. So I couldn't, you know what it's like, I don't know anyone who goes football here, you know what it's like at football grounds, you can't get no reception on your phone, which is one of my bugbears. Ridiculous. And, but how I knew what the scores were, is I was watching the Everton fans. So I see them starting to celebrate. And then somebody in front of me said, yeah, you know what? City had just made it 2-1. Then I see them celebrating again. He goes, it's 2-2, Robbie, about after that. <laughs> and then the last time I see them going absolutely ballistic. A guy near me said, what's up with them? They think they scored a goal or something. And then the guy in front of me goes, City have just scored three. They, they're in the league now, three, two. They're going to win the league. And the Everton fans are going mad. They were so happy, you know what I mean? So that's how I knew the score. But it was an incredible end to the season. And um, Man City and Liverpool, two incredible teams with incredible managers. Final sort of like relevant football questions, I suppose. This Saturday, we're hosting Champions League final viewing party mm -hmm. at the Union. For our members, the sort of sneak peek prediction from, from Robbie Lyle, who do you think is going to win? Oh man, it's so hard to predict that game because I would have said Liverpool, but Real Madrid, I was just wondering if they've got some sort of sign over this competition, especially this year, how they beat PSG. They came back from the dead to win that game. They did it against Chelsea. Chelsea were miles better than them. They managed to get past Chelsea. City, those goals in the last couple, I, I, I think Real Madrid might win it. And I'm sorry, Liverpool fans, but I don't know. It's just what they've done this year at Real Madrid is ridiculous. And they've just got that mentality in their players. It's a bit what we lacked when we had that Newcastle game, when you've got all young players. But these senior players like Benzema and Modric, and they're so experienced and they've got such high quality. I, I think they could, you know, I think they could do it. Um, I don't know. I, I'd, I'd feel sorry. <laughs> I don't know how to feel about it as well because, you know, as a football fan, um, I, I have nothing against Liverpool. I like the football they play and everything, but I know a lot of Liverpool fans. When they were on for that quadruple, I was like, nah, I don't want them to get it. <laughs> because, you know, you never hear the end of it, will you? <laughs> but um, I don't know. I don't mind if Liverpool win it, to be fair, but <clears throat> I just got a feeling Real Madrid. They could do it. Dave's just, it's been incredible what he's done this year. I also lied, I have one more sort of uh, upcoming no question. Um, something that we can all agree on, I hope, in including our Spurs fan, is we all want England to do well this year. Mm -hmm. What uh, do you think England um, has a good chance? Could I think England can win the World Cup. Seriously, I, I was at the World Cup in Russia. I remember when I, when I first went out there, right? Um, everybody's like, do you reckon England can win the World Cup? I was like, I've got no chance. I go, but I'm going to have a bit of fun, drink some vodka, you know what I mean? <laughs> and as the comments just started going along, I was like, hey, you know what? This New England team, with these young players, and the, I like it. I could, especially as a black fan, right? In the past, England's not always been, I have to be honest with you, back in the day, I didn't really, Get, I wasn't really a massive support of the England team because of some of the racism that used to surround it with the fans and stuff like that. I saw a real change right over in Russia. It was really started big time then with Southgate and the players and everything and then how they played. And we got to the semi-final there and I was bitterly, I remember being there and I was at the semi-final, I was bitterly disappointed because I, I thought we were going to win it then. Then we get to the final of the Euros. Now, I know a lot of people have a go at Gareth Southgate and say, oh, well, you didn't win it. But, but we got to the final and we lost on penalties. I think people forget that. And I think when I look at the teams for the World Cup, I think England are good enough to win it. Somebody tell me another really outstanding team. And people say Brazil. Yeah, they're, 
they're a good side, but are they way better than England? I don't, I don't, I don't think they're any better than England. I think England has got as good a players in their 11 as Brazil has. Brazil, um, one of their main guys is Rich Arlinson, a good player. But, you know, we, we've, we've got guys like uh, Sterling, we've got Grealish, Harry, what's his name? <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? So, you know, I, 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 really do, I really do think England can win that World Cup. I, honestly, I, I, and that's not only me just saying that, I really think, look at the players we've got. We've got a great squad. The only thing may be slightly the defence which has always been our strength. Maybe that's not as, you know, Harry Maguire's been having quite a poor season, but the rest of the, you know, I, I, I honestly think that team could, could go the whole way. Touch wood. Um, yeah. <laughs> so a question that one of our members present suggested I ask you beforehand was, going back to obviously how your channel became really big, do you think Wenger was sacked prematurely and would you take him back now, given the last season? Uh, no, I don't think he was sacked prematurely. Um, I think, he, I think he should have went a bit early, if I'm being honest. And this is coming from a guy that I was one of Arsene Wenger's biggest fans. I love it. People, people say to me sometimes, um, oh, yeah, Robbie, but you allowed so many people to come on and they said negative things about Wenger. I think that was towards the end. I think when I first started doing AFTV, I think 90% of the fans were behind Arsene Wenger. Because what he'd done in the past, the respect that they had for him, but I think towards the end of his reign, I think he overstayed. He should have probably went after he won that, the first FA Cup. And actually, if you actually listen to Arsene Wenger, he admits, he said since, that he should have left a bit earlier. And I don't think, no, not to come back either, because he's done his, he's done his time, he did his thing. It's time for a new, it's time for somebody new to come in and try and take it forward. Um, it's a hard act to follow because, you know, look what he, you know, invincible seasons and things like that and leagues and things like that that he won. But um, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think I'd be looking to have him back. Um, maybe he should be involved in the club in some sort of role, um, but not as the manager, no. Um, you touched on something there that, that I, w I want to ask about, which is that several pundits, uh, you mentioned some earlier, and players. Um, a few years ago, we had Hector Bellerin come to I the remember that, yeah. uh, <laughs> and say here well, like grief over that, that, he, that he blamed <laughs> AFTV and, and, and you for, for various problems the club has had over the last few years. Um, and we had some members, and, and, and indeed members of staff here, say similar things to me uh, before this event. How do you respond to these accusations? I never knew it was that powerful. <laughs> you know, um, no, listen, our thing is about giving fans a chance to have their say. If you actually follow our channel um, religiously, and we, we're at every single game, you will see a real consistency in how fans... So, if, for instance, follow the, if you've been following this season, literally the whole season, fans have been right behind Mikel Arteta. There's only been a few you know, <laughs> very horrible losses where fans were like, oh, I've got my doubts, I'm not too sure. So I think if you, you know, you have to remember that if the period that I think um, a couple of years ago, we was going for a really, really tough time. And if you're going for a really, really tough time and you come outside of ground and you ask a fan, what do you think of how we're getting on? They're going to tell you what, how they feel. And that's all we do. You know, we're not... North Korea, where we're going to turn around and say, you know, sorry, because you didn't say something nice, we're not going to put that out. You know, we, we, we allow fans to have their say. I, I would say that, um, you know, we, this, is, this is a business and this is a um, thing that we've built from scratch. Um, there was no blueprint to it. Um, so along the way, probably sometimes we've made a few mistakes. I, I, I always admit that, but we learn from the mistakes that we've made. Um, but I feel that on the whole, when you watch our channel, you see people reflecting, you know, the mood. So I, I, I'll give you an example on the weekend when we missed out on that fifth place. So a lot of fans really, really disappointed. There was a few fans who came on that said, you know, they feel there should be a change of manager. But the majority of fans who came on were like, listen, we finished fifth, we're disappointed, but Mikel Arteta, on the whole, has done a good job and he deserves to carry on and let's strengthen in the summer. 
So you, if, if you watch all the videos as a whole, you'll see, you will see a reflection normally of how the, you know, most fans feel. But everybody's got their opinion. You might not feel that. And it's not my job to shut you down. I, I will challenge you when I'm interviewing you. I will challenge you as to say, right, if you say you wanted us to change the manager, why? Who would you bring in? But, you know, I'll challenge you on those sort of things. But I'm not going to... I'm not attempting to change your opinion. That's your opinion. So why do you think people lay these accusations at AFTV's feet? <sighs> Listen, you, you, in, in anything you do, in any business you do, in any media company you do, you're going to have critics. You have to, you know, the bigger you get, you're going to get critics. You have to take the criticism. And if it's constructive criticism, um, I'll always take it. But some people will level that, that, level that at us, but not, that's not everybody, you know? That's a, and again, they're entitled to their opinion. And, and I respect that. Um, but I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> a couple more questions from me before we open it up to, to, to the members. Um, something we were talking about outside has been the, the rise in women's football, especially in the last year and a half. Um, do you think, obviously there's still a long way to go, why do you think so much progress has been made recently and what do you think the next steps are to increase the profile of women's football? Yeah, women's football has really grown um, and I'm looking forward to the Euros, the women's Euros coming up, <coughs> excuse me, um, this summer over on my other channel, DR Sports, which is a channel that's really exploded. Um, we're going to be doing every single game of the Euros, um, of the women's Euros, and the way in which we're doing it as well, um, I'm deliberately not just trying to focus it on, oh, let's get a load of women in a room and watch a game. I, I, I'm looking at like, let's all watch a game of football. And I, I, I think the, the women's games come on leaps and bounds because it's starting to get the respect it deserves. There are some really talented um, female players. If you watch the Champions League final at the weekend, you know, Lyon and Barcelona, there's some great players in that game. It was a great final. If you watch Arsenal ladies, you know, players like Miedema, I mean, I wish she was a man. <laughs> she could be in the men's team. <laughs> She's that good. You know, her finishing, you know, Beth Mead, you know, the, the quality of the women's game has gone up. And I've been watching it for a few, quite a few years now has risen dramatically. And there's so many more women playing football as well. Like, I, I watch a lot of grassroots football. And you see there's loads of grassroots team now with women playing. And it's so encouraging to see. So I think whereas maybe, I don't know, five to 10 years ago, it was almost like a token type thing where people saying, oh, the women's game, yeah. I think now the reason why we're seeing a big rise in it is that the proper respect is being put on it because they are, they, you know, the women are, are good. <laughs> they are, you know, just like the men, they're super talented. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see where it's going to be in the next 10 years. I really am. I'm really, the other day I was um, chatting to somebody at Arsenal and I was saying to him, why, why can't you have like, say, we're playing Man United. Why can't we have, say, the women's game on first, say Arsenal ladies versus Man United, followed by the men, you know? Um, that, that's what Oxford did with the rugby match this year um, at Twickenham, Oxford versus Cambridge. Yeah, yeah, I think it was. And, and, and I remember Arsenal doing a similar thing in the, the pre-season Emirates Cup where we, we had a women's game first and a men's game. And, you know, because I'm like, that will bring bigger crowds to it. Um, but she was saying to me, and again, uh, the problem is, I think, is that they're different governing bodies, aren't they? There's like, you know, you've got the Premier League and the FA and the, the Women's Super League. The, you know, they're all different. So, um, but I think that could be something that could help. But, you know, it's really growing. Look at some of the crowds that Barcelona got this year. You know, unbelievable. I think Man United got a huge crowd for the Manchester derby and the women. Um, the North London derby, I remember going to that a couple of seasons ago. Um, it was about a year or so ago at Tottenham Stadium where there was over 50,000 for that game. Probably would have been the same for the one that was going to be at the Emirates, but it got called off, um, unfortunately. I think it was due to COVID, so that got called off. But yeah, the women's game is, is really, really developing nicely. Do you think the football personalities, pundits, presenters like yourself, have a duty to try and promote women's football on your on platforms of course. and news? And of course, 100%. Yeah, I, re I really do. And I think, um, 
What I'd like to see them doing in the women's game is really pushing forward um, some of the, the real stars of the game. I think that's what... If you look at the men's games, men's game, even if you're not a diehard football fan of certain clubs, there's certain names that if you went into a room and you said, what do you know about football? People would go, Cristiano Ronaldo, or I know Messi, or I know Haaland, Mbappe. I think there's not enough of that yet in the women's game. I was able to see them start pushing forward some of them superstar women. In America, they do it well. You've got like, people know who Rapino is, you know, and, they, and they'll know all the stars. But over here, I think, you know, I, I'd like to see them sort of, you know, pushing Kerr, Miedemar, you know, Millie really Bright, these names that, you know, these, these are real stars. So maybe that, that when they're looking at the game, they need to look around something like really promoting and pushing those players, because sometimes it's those stars as well that help to a really draws people as an attraction to the... But I think some of that might happen during these Euros. That's why I think it might be really good, because I think for after these Euros, women's Euros are finished, you're going to start seeing, or during it, you're going to see some real names emerge that might become household names. And do you think England, Wales or Scotland have a chance? I think England have got a chance. Um, I don't think Wales and Scotland, unfortunately, do. Um, but I think England have got a chance. I'm not sure if they'll win it. There's some <laughs> good teams in it. Um, France are good. Spain. Um, but, yeah, um, it's, 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 you know, it's on home soil. So why not? It always gives it, you know, there's going to be... There's going to be big crowds for the England games and that, so that, that, that could really help them. Uh, again, touch wood. Um, yeah. Last sort of big topical issue, um, racism in football. We touched on it briefly mm -hmm. earlier. And you mm -hmm. said it's something you've seen change a lot across your time Massive, following yeah. the sport. What do you think the root cause of it is? Why do you think it's getting better? And what more do you think needs to be done about it? It's got a lot better. Um, you spoke earlier about the documentary that I did on ITV. When I first used to go football back in the day, I ain't joking to you when I used to say that some of my friends, you know, my black friends would say, Robbie, you are crazy. They'd go, where are you going? You're going to Chelsea as a black man. Like, you're mad. You're going where? What, you, you're going away to Millwall. What, you know, this, this, guy, this guy's crazy, man. He wants to die, right? It was that bad. Like you go to games, people will leave be openly racist towards you. You go to a policeman for help, he might be racist towards you as well. It was that bad, it was terrible. There's been massive, massive strides, massive, massive improvements um, in the game where now when I go to Chelsea, such a multicultural fan base, it's brilliant to see. But there's still more to be done. We still see instances of racism in games. We saw during the Euros, you know, a lot of it's come onto social media now. We saw players like Saka and Sancho and Rashford being, you know, racially abused. And so it, this is still a big problem. It's not as big as it, it was bigger in those days. It was more open. It was terrible. But it's still a problem. And, and, and I feel that, you know, it's a problem that can be dealt with. I always look at things as a problem that can be dealt with in football. Not the wider society, it's a bigger problem in that, but in football, it can be dealt with pretty easily. And that is if you come to a game and you racially abuse someone, that's it, you're done. You then never come back again. End of. If somebody came into this chamber and called me the n word I'd like to think that you'd never make them come back in here again. <laughs> Membership gone, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So why is it, in, was it any different in football? You know, these, these clubs are broad sometimes a hundred thousand euro fine and things like that. What, what is that? You think some of these guys, these ultras and that, when they see a it's not them, they're not paying for it. You think they care. You think they, they wear that like a badge. They're like, oh, we've got a hundred euro fine. And they shut down their end. I, I remember that time, it was the England game, where, was it, was, was it Hungary they played? I can't remember. And they, all these fans, they came in, they had all these black shirts behind the goal. They were doing all Nazi salutes and that. They made an announcement to them. They did more. Because they know nothing's really... If you know nothing's really going to happen, it's like crime, isn't it? You know? If you know that, you know, 
step into this chamber, nick a couple of statues, you get away with it, you might try. I'm not saying Please me, don't. Don't. <laughs> right? right? But you understand what I'm saying? But if you know that you're going to prison, you ain't going to do it, are you? So, so I, don't, I don't get sometimes, the, especially like a UEFA and these little stupid fines and that, come down hard and stamp it out. I don't get sometimes when you hear some of these um, football clubs saying, oh, we tried everything, we've gone out into the community and we did a lot, but unfortunately, so, no, hold on. You turn around to that club and say, you know, if you don't sort it out, you're no longer in the Premier League or if you don't sort it out, you know, you're not playing in the Champions League. If you can't sort out these racist or homophobic chants, you're t you know, we're going to give you one more chance. We hear that again, you're out of the Champions League next season. You won't be able to come in it. When they think, the owners think about the amount of money they're going to lose, you think they're just going to turn around and say, oh, it was only two people at the back. They will make sure that those people are gone and never to return. So there's ways of, um, there's ways of dealing with this that are quite simple. And we just say zero, you know, zero, zero, zero tolerance and you're out, you're gone. So would you say you support punishing the clubs for the actions of their fans? Do you think they can be held responsible for that? I think you give the club a chance to sort it out first. But if it's just the complete repeat offenders, then yeah, then you're, you know, like I said, if, if it was here, you'd, or you or whoever's in charge would have to take responsibility for the actions of the people in it. If someone's at a nightclub, and somebody's coming in there and they're making trouble every week and they're, they're, they're you know, the, when, when the police come, they come to see you, they're only at the club. You're the licensee. It's your responsibility to deal with that problem. They might, they, they, they're going to shut your club down straight away, but they're going to say to you, yeah, we're going to give you a chance to deal with that situation. That's what should be happening, but all we hear is, oh, there's a fine, a hundred euro fine. Uh, you know, behind closed doors for a game. Wow, so what? Those guys who are doing that, they don't care. Last question before I open it up to the audience, uh, a sort of happier, happier note, I suppose. What would you say your favourite football moment of all time is? If you have one moment that encapsulates your love of football, where you, you know, feel very happy when you think back at it, what would you say it is? I mean, we won the league at White Hart Lane. <laughs> <laughs> he's over there now, he's, he's ducking out now, you know? <laughs> That was a great moment. I always look at, you know what, I always say that my favourite moment wasn't really, it wasn't really a one game, it was a season. It was when we went that season invincible, Arsenal, when we didn't lose a game. That's just like, I remember going to games and I just, you know, I get to the Arsenal station and I just bounced to the ground. You know, I go to every away game, no matter who we're playing. You know, you're driving up to the game. And your mate's going to you, what do you reckon the score is? Uh, who are we playing? Man City, ah, free now. Ah, you light work. You can't do that now. I mean, <laughs> you know, but that season was amazing. It was amazing. And the fact that Arsene Wenger said that season, that I think this team could go and beat them. And all the newspapers, all the media, they ripped into shreds and said, oh, he's like thinking he's being arrogant. And he did it. And I, I just think that was a such, that period, oh, if we could only have that back. <laughs> right, and I'll let you ask, ask your questions. Please raise your hand or membership card in the air uh, and I'll call on you and someone will bring you a microphone. Please stand up, don't ask your question until the microphone's got to you. Uh, the member on the left-hand side in the front row. Or my left, I suppose. Uh, first of all, I just want to say Black Lives Matter and I want to say thank you to the NHS, <laughs> key workers, the doctors, Sorry. everyone out there. <laughs> Uh, no, my question is to you, who would you pick for your all-time Arsenal eleven, and do you think anyone in the current squad could potentially make it into that squad in the future? Oh, in the future? Because then they, they wouldn't make it into it now. <laughs> um, wait, you want me to go through the whole eleven? <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, obviously your Vieiras are in there, your Henri's are in there. I've done an eleven before and like, um, I left out Ian Wright who basically was one of my all-time favourite players, right? And then I saw him and I said, right, I'm sorry, man, I did the 11, I had to leave it out. And he goes, no, it's all right, Henri was. So, um, you know, Tony Adams. I mean, the all-time 11 would be, we've had some great players over the years. 
I don't think any of the current players would get into it now. If I was to look at one current player and say who could possibly get into it in the future, maybe Saka. You know, I'm, I, Saka and Smith Rowe, I've been really impressed with those two young players who've come through, you know, he's come through the Arsenal system and they're such impressive young players, you know, so maybe those two in the future. Thanks. Uh, next question, please. Uh, the member of the front row over here in the middle in the blue sweatshirt. Yeah, so I was going to ask, um, if you had to pick from the era of Arsenal from around 2010 to 2020, that kind of era, if you had to pick one player you'd consider to be an Arsenal legend, who would you pick? Oh, it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> it's not been a great, the greatest appearance. Um, Van Persie? Yeah. <laughs> See? <laughs> I know I know where you're going with this, right? Because I'm just thinking to my... There's, there's names like Van Persie, but I can't. I can't. Be, it, it, Cesc Fabregas, he went... Everybody I'm looking to pick, they've gone. And then they've gone not in... Even a Babi when you see going great circums. It's a really difficult one, man. Oh, my God. Ooh. Whilst he was here, Van Persie, because he, he, he had an amazing season. He had a, whilst he was here, Alexis Sanchez I loved. Ozil had a great period, but it's, all of them kind of ended up sour. That's the thing. So it's really hard to... That's the problem. Um, yeah, I'll come back to you on that. <laughs> You probably have to say Van Persie, he, he, you know, he, he lit it up for a while whilst he was at Arsenal, but I just hate the fact that he went to Man United, you know. I, I, had, the, I had a shirt that I went to a Chelsea game away and he scored a brace and he threw his shirt into the crowd and I got it. And I had that, my daughter's sitting there, I had that framed at home. Pride and joy, like you looked at the shirt, the mud on it and all that. I was like, look at that shirt, I said, like, yeah. And then when he went to the United, I just took that down, I put it in my garage. <laughs> Trust me. Parked it up in the garage, man. I was like, how, how could you go to United? Nah, man. And winning the league as well, nah. Actually, no, it's not Van Persie. It's not Van Persie. <laughs> uh, next question, please. Uh, remember at the back in the white hoodie? Or cream hoodie? Hi Robbie, thanks Hi. for being here. Um, I was just going to ask, who's your favourite fan to interview and is there like a memorable interview um, over the years? Ooh, I always say memorable interview was like when I interviewed a fan, Chris Hudson. Um, he went on a bit of a rant after we lost our first game of the season against Aston Villa. It was a, it, it, the reason being, that summer we hadn't signed anybody really and, and then we went into our first game unprepared and we lost and he did this unbelievable, brilliant rant where he just said it as it was, you know, how we'd been left short at the start of the season. That's kind of always been my all-time favourite. Um, at the moment, I love interviewing Lee Judges. He's guy's just, you know, he, he's, I mean, he's so funny. Um, he's such a character. He's unbelievable, that guy. He just makes me, he just has me laughing all the time. Um, so it's, it's a weird one with him because sometimes like if you lose a game and say you lost to Tottenham you're like I don't really want to interview him today he's going to lose it <laughs> you know what I mean because he's you know but he's such a passionate Arsenal fan he's such a passionate football fan and he's just a legend man his most legendary moment for me was during the Euros right <laughs> he was on um, so on DR Sports which is my other channel we were doing watch alongs to the England game, <laughs> right? <laughs> to the England games, right? And every time Harry Kane scored, he refused. <laughs> he did. We'd all be, everybody in the room would be jumping up and down, yeah, England, and he'd just be sat there like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, come on, man. I go, for, for this, it's England, man. We've got to put our loyalties aside for this. Come on, it's England. He's like, nope, nope. <laughs> Tottenham, Robbie, no, no chance. I, I, not him, not him. I'm not saying... He's legendary, legendary. 
and a really, really nice guy as well, and the most passionate fan you will see. That guy, he's, trust me, he's been hurt from a, he called me the other day, so I'm still hurting, Robbie. He goes, I'm still hurting. He goes, we should have got fourth place. I'm still hurting. I'm just, he goes, no, sorry. I ain't been able to get over it yet. This is what we talk about when we say about the passion of football fans. This is why football fans needed to be heard. Because, you know, a pundit, they do, great, they do a great job, but they do a job. And then they go home and they go and play golf or whatever. They're all right. A football fan, you're hurting. You know, you, you, you invest so much into your team, you're hurting, you know? And then even when you think you've gotten away from it, like what I thought today, I'm like, you know, I'm coming to Oxford. They give a nice talk. As soon as I walk in, there's that guy over there with a the Tottenham shirt. <laughs> right? With a big smile on his face. And you're just thinking, just thinking, I thought I got beyond this, man. But now he's, he's gone and brought it all back again, man. How did we finish below them lot? I mean, you know what I mean? So, football, honestly, football is the greatest game in the world, man. And it's because of the passion of the fans. The fans make the game. If it weren't for the fans, half, a tenth of the game without the fans, in my opinion. I was going to say this question for the end, but now this is like a good time to ask it. Um, do you have a second favourite sport? You know, I, I love, I love um, boxing, really into boxing. I love cricket. My dad, my parents are Jamaican. Um, my dad, when he was alive, passionate West Indian fan. Watch cricket like, you know, <laughs> my, my daughter's there laughing, right? Because he could watch like a test match. He'd watch all five days. When he'd retire, he'd watch it all five. But dad, ain't you bored now, man? I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's running down to a draw. You go, yo, you want to leave me alone, me? I'll watch my cricket. <laughs> <laughs> leave me alone, me? I'll watch my cricket. It's like, all right, cool. So I love cricket. One of my great memories was before he passed away, as I took him to, he always used to, he was old school. So he's like, guys, this 2020 thing, I eat that thing. You know what I mean? Like BS Marlin. And just, I said, Dad, just come and watch one, man. So I got him a ticket, went to the Oval. West Indies were playing England, and Chris Gale that night knocked the ball all over the park, and he loved it. And then when we was going home now, I said, see, I told you, 2020 is good, I told you, like, all right. That's <laughs> <laughs> all bad, all right. <laughs> but he loved, he loved cricket, so because of his love of cricket, I used to watch cricket a lot, I used to play cricket a lot as well. You know, I, I, I genuinely like, likes, I'm, I'm a lover of sports. So I, I watch, I love F1, I love F1, I really love that, I, I, tennis, I, anything, I, I, the, only thing I, the only sports I'm, I find in golf a bit difficult, watching it, I've tried, you know, I mean the other day I was trying to watch a bit of it, I was like, you know, I don't know man, maybe it's a bit too quiet for me, you know what I mean, but then I, you know, so, but I'd say boxing, cricket, rugby I like, you know, I, I, I really do like my sports, but football's first. <laughs> because I just feel that the passion, as I said once again, just the passion of football, I think is just a level above those, those sports. Although I'd love to, I always say I'd love to go to India and watch an IPL game because that, that, looks, that looks off the hook, you know? So. Thank you. Um, yes, the, the very keen member over there. Hey, Robbie. Um, is t what is Ty like in real life? Is it is he the same? <laughs> <laughs> is he the same as on AFTV? And also, sort of side question: How does he keep? Uh, how does he afford to buy all the merch every year? <laughs> <laughs> he's worse than what you see him on screen. Like he's so hype. He's he no, he's non-stop. We was coming back from Manchester yesterday. It's me, him, and Pippa. And honestly, on the way up there. I thought the train ride was about 10 minutes. He didn't stop talking, right? If you ever, if you go to a football game, you're tired, bring him. You know, like you're driving home after a game, you're knackered, you're driving back from Newcastle to London. Put Ty in the car, the journey will be like a half hour. <laughs> but you don't stop at all. He's, he's just, and if you ever say anything bad about Arsenal and you're not an Arsenal fan, if you're an Arsenal fan, you could say, you know, you could have a bit of criticism. If you're not an Arsenal fan, no matter who you are, 
and you say anything bad about Arsenal, he's on you. He's, he's honestly, he's, inc- he's incredible. For, he goes to watch, he watches every Arsenal game, home and away. He watches women's games. The only, the only women's games he misses really is if they clash with a men's game. He goes to watch the under 23s. He, honestly, he's, a, he's addicted to Arsenal. He's, that is not an act with that guy. He's worse than what you see. He's, he, honestly, he's like, I'd love, like, sometimes when people ask me, they go, Ruby, is he really like that? I'm like, I'd love to be able to take that person and just say to you, go and spend a day with him. You know, you need to lie down for about a week, trust me. But he's, he's a mad, 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 passionate, passionate, passionate fan. Even when he goes to watch the women's game, all the women there, they all know him. They all come to him, oh, Ty, how are you doing? Well, you're talking to him and stuff like that, because he, he's, been, he's been going to watch the women's game long before... You know, for some people it became a thing. He was going to watch that from like, there was, there'd be like hardly anyone there. He was there watching those games. Same with the under 23s. A lot of the young players, they know Ty because long before they made a name for themselves, he was there watching them. He knows all of them. Yeah, so he's, and, it, and he, yeah, every year he, uh, he buys his, uh, he gets his merch in. You know what I mean? <laughs> which, which I noticed yesterday he had on Arsenal trainers, right? We went to Nigeria, right? Um, one of the guys told me, Arsenal underpants. I'm like, yo, that's t- <laughs> too much information now, you know what I mean? I mean but no, no he's, he's, and, and, and also with him, he's the, he's the most genuine, lovely guy you'll ever meet. Really, really nice person. Um, but just off the scale, passionate Arsenal fan. Off the scale, you know? You won't meet no one like him again. He's like... People like him are just there, just one-offs. They only made one. Thank God. <laughs> I'm only joking. He sees this, I'm only joking. Yeah. Next question, please. Uh, gentleman in the green at the end of the front row. Hi. So um, you mentioned about sort of the need to strengthen in the summer. Um, have you got sort of three sort of specific positions or targets that you would go, you know, yeah, I, I really think they would kind of improve the team? Yeah. Well, we need a striker. Um, we may need three because at the moment we've only got two. We let Aubameyang go. We didn't replace him. Um, Eddie and Ketia might go, so we're going to have to replace him. And I think Lacazette will go. So we need, I think we need three strikers. Um, we need a central midfield player like a holding midfielder player. We needed it for years and we still haven't got it, so we need that. Um, and I think, we need a, I think we're going to need another centre-back. I, I, I think we need about 10 players, that's my opinion. <laughs> I said, no joke. You know, I mean, when I think about the amount of players that are leaving, you know, um, Ainsley Maitland-Niles, who's playing tonight for Roma, he's leaving. I mean, Gwen Doozy's leaving, Pablo Mari's leaving, um, Eddie Nketiah, Lacazette. You know, there's, there's loads of players that are leaving and the, their contracts are coming to an end. And as I said, next season, because of those factors that I sort of spoke about earlier, we're going to need a big squad. Um, so I think we need to make a lot of signings, unless there's maybe a few youngsters that can come up and fill a couple of those places. But if we're really, my, my thing is I want to start seeing Arsenal now challenging. And the only way we're going to do that is... You know, we have to spend money. I mean, that's the nature of football now. The teams that spend the most money win the league. If you don't believe me, Man City have won it four out of the last five years. The teams that spend the least amount of money go down. Look at this season, Burnley, Watford, Norwich. Economics, it's pretty simple in football. If you don't spend, you've got no chance of winning that league. End off. And we've got billionaire owners I'm not saying for them to go out and be absolutely ridiculous, but I think if they genuinely want to give Mikel Arteta a chance next season to challenge City, to challenge Liverpool, to challenge Chelsea, um, they're going to have to spend a lot of money this summer. Simple as. Maybe we have time for one more question, uh, so please raise your hands in the air. Uh, the gentleman in the white... Oh, yeah, the Spurs, the Spurs, the Spurs <laughs> fan. Oh, I knew he'd get, he knew, I knew he'd get me. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm just wondering, like, how did your relationship with expressions kind of start out? Because obviously you've got your best of enemies. I'm just wondering how that kind of started. 
Yeah, by the way, that's a, you know, it's one of my favorite shows that I do. Um, Best of Enemies on DR with expressions. And I remember when I, when I sort of came up with the idea, I said, yeah, because we'd done um, f a few little things before. And I said, listen, you're Tottenham, I'm Arsenal, but we're good friends, best of enemies. And then we just started doing content together and um, he's, he's, uh, he's brilliant. How he comes up with these things, these little one-liners and stuff like that. And he's had me under pressure <laughs> the last few weeks, he really has. Um, but yeah, no, it's, 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 a, it's a really great show. Um, and I think what, what I'm trying to do as well with shows like that is show that, you know, even though we're deadly rivals as far as football's concerned, um, it doesn't have to cross the line and be anything stupid. It can, you know, we, we, we have friends that, you know, of, they're of rival clubs, but it's banter. It's, enjoy it, have fun with it. You know, obviously you'd be hurting when your team loses and stuff like that, but, you know, that's, that's trying to, what we're trying to do a lot of times with our platform as well, you know, have fun with it. It doesn't have to end up in a fire. It doesn't have to end up in, you know, terrible things being said and that. You know, have fun with it and we move on to the next game, you know, because that, that is football. So I think we kind of capture that with that show. And, but he's had me under some serious pressure. <coughs> for the last couple of weeks, you know, because, uh, yeah, Tottenham got one over us. One final question before, from me before we have to wrap up, and it's a question that we ask all of our speakers when they come and visit. If you could give, in two or three sentences, one piece of advice to the members of the Oxford Union and of Oxford University, what would it be? Ooh, I always say consistency, because um, when, I, when I look at how we've built our platform, it's been through consistency. I say we're at every game... We, everything we do, we do consistently. Um, so I think if you're in a great place like this, um, if you're consistent with what you're doing, you're gonna, you're gonna end up well. You're gonna end up well. You're gonna come out here and you're gonna do really well. So be consistent with uh, your studying and your work and what you're doing here and it's gonna end well. That's what I'd say. So that, that's always my key, key thing. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Mr. Robbie Lyle. Thank you very much.